All right. Welcome to another episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I have a very special guest on the show with me today, Dr. Paul Wand. Dr. Wand, welcome to the show. Thank you and good morning. Morning. Dr. Wand is a very interesting guy. He is a neurologist with an extensive expertise in diagnosing and treating concussions of all types. He has focused on neuroscientific research since medical school and has pursued clinical research through his private practice for more than 30 years, along with making a number of clinical discoveries. Dr. Wand has been in private practice in South Florida since 1982, and he recently came out with a great book uh, called The Concussion Cure, uh, Three Proven Methods to Heal Your Brain a book I just read and learned a lot from um, as far as uh, your approach to treating uh, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, Very interesting stuff. So Dr. Wan, I'm very happy to have you on the show today. Thank you. I am as well. Awesome. Well, tell me a little as, you know, first kind of how you, uh, how you got into the field of neurology, um, kind of what, you know, was it something going when you started med school? Did you kind of know that you wanted to, to do that, or how did, how did that kind of unfold? Well, I was always interested in the brain and fascinated by how it worked, especially memory and language. And I took some courses in psychology and, and uh, in college, as well as the whole biology major, science, medical science, pre-med and sciences. And that ultimately led to, you know, a decision to go to medical school. And then when I was a third year medical student taking uh, neuroanatomy, I read a particular article by a neurologist who was known to be what's called a behavioral neurologist, which is sort of like frontier between psychiatry and neurology, because there's a very blurred line sometimes. And I got an idea to start doing research on the brain, which required me to go to the laboratory and asked the professor of of neuroanatomy if I could, you know, be uh, like a volunteer and, you know, cut up brains and look at flies under the microscope. And uh, he said, yes, of course, but he had no interest in what I was doing. So he didn't mentor me. And uh, that, that research continued when I was a resident uh, in neurology and I had kind of the same situation. It was a department with about 10 neurologists and everybody had their own lab and everybody was doing their own kind of research and not a one person was interested in what I was doing. So again, I had no mentorship. I had a little bit of help from a PhD neuroanatomist who helped me with how to color, color the slides and instead of using fresh brain, use what's called fixed brain, which is much more available than me going to the um, Suffolk County morgue uh, when people would come in and I made a deal with the medical examiner to get fresh brains and I was on call for the morgue for a while. Anyway, so, so I had a big interest in, you know, in research uh, from, uh, from the get go, you could say. And uh, when I did not go into um, academic medicine, I still kind of kept that uh, burning desire to do research and, uh, discover new things and come up with new, new new forms of either diagnosis or treatment. And so I continued to do that into my, into my practice, which ultimately led to uh, making a very important observation in TBI, traumatic brain injury patients of all types and sorts using the SPECS technology, which is a nuclear medicine scan, which showed a very characteristic and typical pattern of uh, decreased blood flow, what we call hypoperfusion. And that was in 1990 when I started to do that. And um, after a number of patients uh, were, were studied using the technology, I postulated, well, if everybody has a decrease of blood flow in the brain, why wouldn't the treatment be an increase of blood flow? Sort of a very simple yet elegant uh, uh, concept. And so I started to prescribe a medication that was specifically approved to increase blood flow in the brain, um, which is a member of the calcium channel blocker, but a very special member because of its very high liposolubility, which allows us to get into the brain, whereas the other calcium channel blockers don't have that. 
features so that they don't get into the brain and they don't work because I tried them all by the way. And um, so I observed after prescribing the medication that like pretty much everybody got better. And then uh, shortly after that, I found out about the use and the indication of hyperbaric oxygen. And then by that time, it was either 1995 or 1996, I had a case, my first case of severe TBI where the patient was in a coma initially with bleeding in the brain, in that case on the left side. And I had the opportunity to videotape his neurological examination pre-treatment, which showed him to be severely impaired in a wheelchair, horribly slurred speech. And he was treated with uh, the medication, which I increased the dose over time to a very high dose and hyperbaric oxygen. He was also getting all the other traditional modalities of physical therapy, speech therapy, uh, occupational therapy, balance therapy. I mean, you name it. He was, he was going to therapy at the center that referred the patient to me like between five and six hours a day, getting all these different things. But he was still very impaired when he met me and he had a lot of uh, you know behavioral problems and was very aggressive and other doctors put him on medication to control his aggressive behavior blah 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 to make a long story short he responded so well after 62 treatments of hyperbaric even though he was ordered to have 90 i decided to re-videotape his status to document the improvement and uh, in the online digital version of the book there's actually a link to these two videos, the pre and the post, um, which shows the neurological, neurological examination and his difficulty with speech and weakness on the right side. And um, the, the, second, the second video, the post treatment is actually, before he actually finished all the hyperbaric, but he was so much better that everybody could see that. So the digital version has the live link. The print version has a link, but you know, it's, print copy doesn't go to internet so sure sure so before we dive any further into the the treatment modalities that you found to be super helpful can you first kind of break down for our listeners what actually is going on in the brain when there is a traumatic brain injury we we mentioned briefly the the decreased blood flow or hypoperfusion but what else what else happens when there's a hit to the head well, there's multiple mechanisms of injury to the brain. I consider that the hallmark and the most significant injury is a decrease of blood flow, which comes from a spasming of the arteries, which most likely comes from bleeding of the brain, which is irritative to the arteries, which causes them to go into spasm and can also cause seizures. Um, all cases have microscopic bleeding because we know that from autopsy study, and you can't see that on a CAT scan or even on an MRI, at least a 3.0 Tesla. If we're talking about a higher magnet strength, maybe we can, but they're not available now, so that's sort of like a moot point. So my, my postulate back in 1990 was there was this microscopic bleeding that caused the spasm and the other thing that happens is the calcium channels open up as a result of the uh, bleeding and damage to the brain because there's also a shearing effect because the brain floats inside the skull, especially in the front. So the, that explains why the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes get the brunt of the injury. And there's also, it also explains why there's a gradient from front to back. So the severity is from front or frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and then the least of the injury is towards the back. The back of the brain is quasi-fixed, so it moves less. So it gets less of an impact, less of the twisting, and that twisting is sometimes known as a axonal shear injury, which is where the cortex on top of the brain is moving at a different rate than the brain stem and the basal ganglia, and you get that uh, stretching, which actually you know, it interrupts the white matter axons, which connects the different parts of the, of the brain. So the, um, the mechanism is also um, notable because when all these things are going on, there's inflammation happening and there's opening up of these calcium channels, which allows the calcium to go into the cell. When the calcium goes inside the cell, that initiates a very complex metabolic cascade, uh, 
And the result of that cascade is the cell dies, what we call apoptosis. So the second mechanism of action of the drug, which is called nimotapine, brand name is nimotop, um, is to block the calcium channel. And when I give lectures on this, which I recently gave a lecture in Denver to an uh, international group of neurofeedback therapists, I have a very pretty picture, uh, artistic rendition of the, uh, the medication which sits on top of the channel, blocking and preventing the calcium from going in. So essentially what that means is that you can save cells by taking this drug. And it should also be pointed out that when you lose cells, and you lose enough of them, that causes a loss of size or st structure to the brain, which means um, the brain becomes smaller, which we call atrophy. And we also know that each individual neuron is attached to 10,000 other neurons. And that is multiplied by many fold in terms of the synapse. So every time you lose one cell, you're losing you know, millions of synapses and you know, that's the loss of connectivity, which is how the brain works, basically. Every part is connected to many other parts. Right. So, and this is basically something that can take place even if someone hasn't, you know, sustained a massive head injury, you know, um, where there's internal bleeding. But, you know, if someone, say, you know, is a football player and, you know, they get, they get hit in the head, you know, um, or kind of woozy, you know, show symptoms of maybe a concussion, and then they go and get an MRI, and what you're kind of saying, right, is that the that sort of technology, what's currently being used to sort of diagnose these head injuries, may not be specific enough in order to actually see this sort of damage taking place in the brain. Is that correct? Pretty much so. Uh, it's probably more accurate to say that the MRI is not the MRI at 3.0 Tesla, which is the state of the art today, you know, a few years ago it was 1.5, but you know, technology progresses. So today it's at the 3.0 level and there's different types of 3.0, I should add. Um, the technology is not sensitive enough to see it. I think on the 7.0, which is the next level of MRI, which is available for academic research, uh, you could probably see the microscopic bleeding with that because the resolution is, you know, so many times greater. Mm -hmm. So you talk about in your book, I thought it was really interesting, the, the sort of alternative methods that you, you've, you know, uh, in a lot of ways pioneered as far as using them in practice, um, in addition to what you mentioned, the spec scan, but also uh, doing QEEGs uh, and QEPs, which I thought was interesting, um, something I didn't know a ton about. How have you found those to be helpful in, in sort of diagnosing head injuries? So the quantitative EEG is a computerized EEG, which is significantly more sensitive than the standard EEG, which is read by a visual inspection and does not have any statistical analysis attached to it. Whereas the quantitative EEG has a statistical database to which the individual patient in question is compared to, so that if the patient's EEG data is different, you know, it's expressed by standard deviations with two deviations plus or minus being the threshold for cutoff for abnormalities. So then when the patient's data, EEG data is quantified, and then we get a, a what we call a Z-score, which is pretty much the standard deviation score, um, it does no longer become anybody's opinion of I think the EEG is normal or I think it's abnormal. You know, it's, it's a mathematical statement of fact and observation. So that's what makes it, um, that's one of the reasons why it makes it a more uh, objective and a better test and a more sensitive test. It actually taught me to go back to the standard EEG and look at it a little, a little bit more carefully and read it more closely. And what I found out was that many of the things that we were told were not significant, you know, in training uh, was based upon somebody's subjective personal opinion, which turns out to be not correct. Because when you subject it to the database, it says otherwise. And I would, I would much um, go with and believe and adopt a mathematical opinion as opposed to somebody's personal opinion. Anyway, 
Um, so the the other advantage of the quantification in QEEG is that once we get all these specific abnormalities at very specific frequencies, at specific deviations, at very specific parts of the brain, uh, we can create a protocol to retrain them, which is a process called neurofeedback, which is based upon a, a principle of what's called operant conditioning, and um, the brain can actually be retrained. And in, and, and doing so, the abnormal brainwave patterns that a person may acquire after an injury can actually be retrained and be replaced by new ones, which are normal, and that's reinforced over a number of times. And eventually, the, the old patterns kind of just go away, and the new ones kind of take over and dominate, and then we replace the abnormal with the normal, and then the person gets better, and their brain is fixed. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's what? the QG. The, QE, the QEP, which I did largely from starting from 1987 until about the year 2000, um, that was a, a, um, a diagnostic test that was offered with a machine that I had purchased back in the day that did the QEG. Uh, most machines today, uh, which are much better and more powerful and faster computers, they either offer one or the other. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't, they, not too many offer both, but the evoked potentials are a series of uh, tests where the person is given a stimulus. For example, there's a visual test, so that's a visual evoked potential. And then there's a, a brainstem test, which is not used generally for concussions, uh, but can be used in concussions if the person is dizzy, which is very common but more so to see if the uh, if there's been any damage to the brainstem, which typically doesn't happen unless it's a severe case because the, the brainstem is at the base of the brain and it's protected by the skull all around it, the brain above it. So it takes a lot of force for the energy to get down there and you know either twist it or turn it or pull it or, or whatever it does or cause bleeding locally. Um, but what I found was because I had the ability to do the brainstem test for dizziness with 20 channels, a full scalp, I was actually able to look at the potential after it came out of the brainstem and went up to the cerebral cortex because any uh, sound that goes into the head, you know, ends up in the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe to be registered as a sound and then to be interpreted in the adjacent area as you know, what kind of sound. So, uh, it turned out when I did research comparing the the frequency of of abnormalities of this uh, this Bayer test, which I named the quantitative Bayer or Q Bayer, uh, excuse me, that the wave seven um, of the cortical potential corresponded very well to the patient symptoms. It turned out to be um, over ninety five or ninety seven percent positive uh, identification when comparing. Uh, the given abnormality on one side of the brain in one hemisphere with other tests like neuropsychological testing. The quantitative EEG was like, you know, maybe 87 or 88 percent, but the quantitative bear was actually more sensitive. The other reason that it was good to do those potentials is because it's always better to have more data than less data. So if there was a focal abnormality, let's say on the right, on the front, on the left, on the back, like I have in one of the cases that I that I demonstrate, um, if you, and that pattern was seen on the quantitative EEG a number of times, so it's dupl more than duplicated. And, and then if you do the battery of the quantitative rogue potentials and you see abnormality in the right frontal and left posterior, well, then you have EEG data, you have visual data, you have a cognitive test, which could show that too. You have multiple different tests that all show that these parts of the brain are abnormal. You could be much more assured that those are real findings and not something that is happening by chance. And sure. that's typically what, what would happen. Okay, and tell me a little as far as, what do we know as far as the electrical abnormalities that result from a head injury? Because we talked a little as far as, as blood flow, um, but what do you see as far as um, when you do the QEEGs, what changes when, when someone sustained a head injury? Right. Well, um, on the plain EEG, we can see different categories of abnormality. Notably, we see we see slowing, uh, 
Although, say for example, if we're doing the person, testing the person with eyes open, they're obviously they're awake. They're not supposed to have slow wave patterns like what we call theta and even delta. And moreover, they're not supposed to have those slow wave frequencies in a focal or a specific part or lobe of the brain because the brain works symmetrically from the electrical point of view, even from the vascular perfusion point of view. We expect symmetry everywhere so that when we see asymmetry that's considered to be not normal, also when we see asymmetry, especially from front to back, that's a pattern that's consistent with the trauma pattern. We can also see other electrical patterns on the plane EG um, where the cortex becomes irritable. So we can see bursting. We can see bursting of slowing. We can see bursting of uh, sharp waves, phase reversals. These are signs of cortical irritability, which is very, very common. And I see them all the time. Um, and it's just a question of a degree of how much one person gets compared to another, which is also dependent upon the severity. On a quantitative EEG, we, we have other measures, which that's more, a little more difficult to explain just here at a broadcast. But one of the measures that we look at, for example, is connectivity. And um, we, can, we can assess the connectivity from one point to multiple other points from one electrode site. So uh, what we see in um, the typical pattern that we see in the TBI is a decrease of connectivity called hypocoherence in short pairs, meaning like within one lobe or between one lobe or the other, and yet at the same time seeing long paired hypercoherence. And it's easy to recognize that pattern because they're color coded on a quantitative EG that I use, and the combination of the short paired underconnection or hypocoherence and long paired overconnection or hyper coherence is also another characteristic pattern of trauma. Interesting. So when was it that you sort of uh, started taking this QEEG or EEG data, um, seeing the electrical abnormalities of the brain, and then started applying um, neurofeedback to sort of retrain these electrical rhythms? Right, right, right. So I did not start using neurofeedback until I met up with a colleague in about 2007. And at that time he was doing his own quantitative EEG. It was a different system that he was using compared to what I had had before. He was not doing the evoked potentials, but that seems to be less popular in our days. And no one gets a treatment protocol from that anyway. So people concentrate on the quantitative EEG. And, um, you know, we, we kind of met up and uh, we ultimately decided to share office space. And we did that uh, up until about a year ago. And, you know, we had many patients going back and forth. Uh, we published a couple, a couple of different uh, papers together, uh, including um, um, a chapter on um, the correlation between quantitative EEG and spec scan which I had studied that previously in the 1990s. And um, that was uh, part of uh, a book called Z-Score Loretta Neurofeedback, which is sort of like, I guess you could say it's the Bible for Z-Score Loretta Neurofeedback, which is using the statistical analysis before, during, and after the training sessions to make sure that the training is effective it's reducing or correcting the deviation, whatever it may be, and bring it, bringing those new brain waves back into the normal range so it tells you when to stop training. Right, right. So the neurofeedback is really basically able to kind of reshape these electrical rhythms um, so you get them back into kind of the, the healthy ranges as measured sort of by the Z-score. Is Correct. that... Got it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you kind of have now like a sort of a three pronged approach that you, you talk about in the book as far as using um, the nemodipine uh, medication along with neurofeedback, along with the third thing that we, we briefly touched on. But could you tell me a little more about hyperbaric oxygen? And I think maybe, you know, some of our listeners may have, you know, heard about that as far as wound healing, um, but as far as the uses for the brain, 
uh, doesn't seem to be as well known about. So how does that technology sort of do its, its magic? Interesting that you brought up the reference to wound healing, because I always like to say when I'm talking about uh, hyperbaric oxygen is that pretty much everybody knows in the medical field that hyperbaric oxygen is the last resort to, that one goes to before considering amputation if it's on a limb, or if you're trying to heal some infection or whatever you're trying to heal. And it's, it's so well recognized that all insurance companies pay for it. However, they do not recognize the, quote, invisible wound, unquote, in the brain, which is a traumatic brain injury, so they don't pay for it. Um, there has been one notable exception to that. A few months ago, uh, Congress was presented with overwhelming data that hyperbaric oxygen by itself could help reverse the signs and symptoms in veterans coming back from the Middle East wars with PTSD, one of the hallmark injuries, and blast concussion, the other hallmark injury, that there can be reversal of um, these the symptoms and the signs just due to the hyperbaric. So the Congress actually voted that the uh, insurance companies are going to have to pay for those conditions in in the veterans, so it's a limited population. Um, but uh, I don't think it's really come to pass yet because they they have to, I guess, do a separate legislative act for for the funds to be permitted. I don't know exactly how that part works, but it's a small victory and it's a step in the right direction. But the, so the hyperbaric oxygen works by multiple mechanisms. Uh, there are at least eight mechanisms that I researched and you know it's just not the extra oxygen, um, but it can also reduce inflammation in the brain, which obviously whenever there's an injury, there's always inflammation, which is a reason to recommend anti-inflammatory medication that only penetrate the blood-brain barrier to be able to get into the brain. It can also reduce edema, which is a result of the inflammation, the injury. It can also reduce intracranial pressure which is typically in the acute phase of the more severe cases. It can also promote the growth of axons. And that was demonstrated in a very elegant study, uh, an Israeli study done on about 40 patients that had um, baseline MRI with a technique called DTI to see the white matter tracts and uh, some psychological testing. And they had about 40 treatments and they showed the post specs, the pre and post spec scans, which showed a significant decrease beforehand, normalization of the spec scan after the treatments. And they actually showed on the MRI uh, DTI segments, uh, the pre and post, and it's pretty clear and dramatic, that there was an increase of uh, size and girth of white matter tracts. So the brain actually is able to regenerate part of its structure, which is quite, quite remarkable. Um, nobody thought that that could even be done five or 10 years ago. Interesting, okay. And then what are, what are some of the other mechanisms in which that the hyperbarics work? Well, it, you know, there's, there's, there's a long list and uh, you know, I don't have them all memorized in my head, but there's sure. free radical uh, protection. Uh, there's other metabolic effects. Um, there's um, um, neurogenesis, so there's uh, new nerve cells can be grown as well as the white matter tracts. That implies that new dendritic connections can be created. So there's there's really quite a quite a few. Okay, interesting. And is this something? Do we know? Is this like the the neurogenesis is something that interests me a lot? Is that something you think would only apply? Uh, like in cases with TBIs and then someone hops in a hyperbaric chamber, or is that something where in the future people might start using uh, a hyperbaric uh, oxygen just to improve overall brain health? I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that because that's a research question. That's going to require research and data to get the answer. I suspect the answer is yes. 
And I, I should also add a yet another mechanism is angiogenesis, which means the creation of new blood vessels. So that would also be particularly beneficial uh, because since the problem is decreased blood flow, which is in a way there's the relative loss of you know circulation, if you can create new blood vessels, you're going to increase the circulation. So that's yet another important mechanism. Interesting. And then I know there's a chapter in your book as far as uh, looking at kind of supplements, nutrients that can also play a role in treating these TBIs. What, what specifically, what are your favorites that you found? Well, um, I have a very physiological approach to that. I like to recommend um, products which can act as the substrates to repairing the, the damaged cells and the membranes. So for example, the, the most important ingredients uh, for cell membranes are the omega-3 fatty acids like the EPA and especially the DHA. Uh, there's another one that goes into the cell membrane uh, called phosphatidylserine, which helps to keep and maintain the fluidity of the membrane. So the integrity of the membrane, which conducts the impulse is extremely important. Um, there's also um, uh, other ingredients that serve as the precursor uh, to the uh, neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. And there's a variety of different ones that are available that contain different components, which once they get into the brain, they can be incorporated to increase or replenish the quantity of those neurotransmitters. Um, there's also anti-inflammatories, which are very good. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, curcumin, which is known to penetrate the brain and um, is also found in the Indian spice called curry. And there's actually epi epi hello, epi epi epidemiological studies that show that the incidence of dementia less Alzheimer's less in India. And one hypothesis about why that is true is because uh, most people there eat curry, which has the curcumin, which is going to go into their brain and reduce inflammation, which is a major uh, player as far as mechanism, what goes wrong in Alzheimer. Not the only one, of course, very complicated disease. We still don't know yet everything that's happening. We still don't have a good treatment for it, but nevertheless, uh, we know that inflammation in general is very bad. Uh, it's associated with chronic degenerative diseases. It's also associated with cancer. So it's not, a, it's always a good idea to take some kind of an anti-inflammatory. And there, there are some others. There's another one uh, that's derived from Boswellia. Um, I like to use life extension products because I know that they're pure. They're uh, pharmaceutical grade supplements, which is hard to find and hard to determine as well. And so I, I tend to recommend those two as, as anti-inflammatories. And there's some others, um, ginkgo biloba, is um, a very well-known and well-studied supplement to increase cerebral circulation, especially that would be especially important for patients who can't take the medication, which is expensive. So not then, everybody can get it. Not everybody can get it and everybody has insurance. If they don't have insurance, it's hard for them to afford it. Sure. I'm curious, do you think magnesium has a role uh, uh, or can play a role in sort of treating TBIs? Because I know when you mentioned the the nemotipine being a calcium channel blocker, um, from my understanding, that's also what magnesium does. But is that is there enough uh, calcium blocking in the brain for magnesium to be effective? Good question. It turns out that the mechanism of magnesium, which is considered to be neuroprotective, is that in the calcium channel which is a very complicated, um, I guess, well, when we look at it in slices, it looks like it's 2D, but it's 3D. It's obviously, it goes all around like that. There's two major pillars. And in one of the pillars, it had, both of them have you know, different subunits, complicated biochemistry, but there's a receptor for magnesium in one of them. So the role of magnesium is to participate in maintaining the integrity of the calcium channel itself. Interesting. So would that be something, I mean, I don't know if there's been any research done, but if someone had 
you know, say they were taking, they're already taking a, like a magnesium supplement or just getting a lot of magnesium through their diet. Would it make sense to you that they may actually be sort of protecting their brain in case there is a head injury that those calcium channels wouldn't be quite as affected or is. I don't think as a standalone treatment, it would work. But aside from that, there's a huge problem to get uh, magnesium levels uh, into the body and, and therefore into the brain. Um, all the pills that are available, and there's multiple types of, you know, magnesium oxide and magnesium sulfate and citrate goes on and on and on. Um, they all have very poor absorption, which is estimated to be between three and 5%. So, you know, if you take a hundred milligram tablet, you're getting three to five milligrams, which is really very little. The daily requirement for average adult is between three and 400 milligrams a day. So it's really sub sub dose. The problem is complicated by the fact that uh, if you want to know if you're deficient in magnesium, you do a blood test. Uh, most doctors don't know that the serum magnesium is the least accurate of all tests available. And there's a special test called red blood cell magnesium, which needs to be requested specifically by the lab to determine the more accurate magnesium level. So it's so the magnesium story is 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 a good one and it said I like it and uh I would refer interested readers to a book called The Magnesium Miracle by Caroline Dean. She's an MD and an ND, naturopathic doctor, and she is like a an expert in magnesium and much of the stuff that I learned uh about magnesium comes from her and she also makes her own product um, which is available as a as a liquid to be diluted into water to drink, to have 100% absorption of the magnesium because she she claims that she actually created the product because she needed it for herself, but now she sells it. So. Interesting. She's helping, yeah. She's helping. She's helping a lot of people by doing that. I drink it myself for hypertension. Interesting. Okay. And then yeah. what what role do you think diet? plays as far as traumatic brain injuries or the the recovery um do you uh is there any research as far as like ketogenic diets standard american diets does that play any role uh i don't think there's any convincing um uh, uh data on that although i have not researched that as thoroughly as i researched some of the other points that we talked about uh, but I mean, in general, for a person's good health, I don't recommend the typical American diet. It's horrible. It's high in omega sixes, which are are not healthy. Um, and I recommend everybody to try to eat as healthy as they can, meaning uh, avoid all those bad saturated fats. Take many supplements, including omega threes. Try to tip the balance to have more three, omega threes compared to omega sixes, which is normally more more prevalent and even in, in, in good, good diets. Um, and, uh, you know, not to overeat because obesity is associated with so many other diseases and so forth. And, you know, kind of like common sense, uh, ketogenic diet, there is literature on that, that that is useful to treat seizures, um, which could be applicable. If someone has a case of post-traumatic epilepsy or post-traumatic seizure. So one can make an argument for that. Uh, ketogenic diet is also recommended for other uh, non-neurological conditions, which you know we don't really need to talk about those right now. Uh, so the, the the dietary thing is a minor place, I think, but it does have does have a, you know some role. Interesting. Okay. And then, so I, I'm curious as far as like you do you think there's a synergy? Uh, I mean, I, I assume there probably is. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what you talk about in the book, but, you know, you use this, this kind of like three pronged or, or, you know, these, these main three, uh, things being the nemotipine neurofeedback and the hyperbarics. Um, do you think they kind of complement each other? Do they work synergistically? Absolutely. Um, what I've noticed with the other doctor, when he was around and we were having, um, you know, many patients go back and forth getting uh, neurofeedback and taking nemotipine is that the patients that ha were, were taking the medication, uh, they seemed to do better. And I, you know, kind of thought about it, figured out that uh, what happens is when someone's undergoing neurofeedback, uh, 
and you're using your brain for anything, but let's just use the specific example of uh, you're looking at a video, or you're playing a game, you're doing something to perform the feedback, there's an automatic demand for an increase of blood flow. And because these patients have the problem of the blood flow, the decreased blood flow, they can't always meet that demand. And sometimes that creates a relative block for the progress of the neurofeedback. So what we have noticed is that when the patients take the medication, the imodipine, and their blood flow is increased, they get through that block and they can proceed and achieve a higher level of, of training and, and healing with, with both of them. So we, we like to say that they work synergistically. Interesting. Okay. I'm curious as far as, you know, what you see, you know, as a neurologist, uh, it, I mean, it seems like, you know, the field sometimes of neurology and, and psychiatry are kind of divided, but with traumatic brain injuries, do you see, I mean, are, do a lot of people that come in to see you have a lot of kind of psychiatric complaints? Yes, most of them do. Depression, anxiety, you know, sleeping problems, pain problems, which adds to their depression. Right. Um, and it's, it's, it's understandable because you know, the brain controls behavior, and if the brain is affected in a, in a bad way, it's going to result in, you know, some abnormal behaviors, particularly when it's in the frontal lobes, which, as I said before, gets the brunt of the injury. So, you know, the, in, in neurology and psychiatry, we, you know, we use this term disinhibition, which means that the frontal lobes, which are supposed to be monitoring your thinking and your behavior, and telling you, you know, don't do this because it's wrong, it's socially not acceptable, you know, when you don't have that monitor working properly, then the the other parts of the brain, let's say the more primitive parts of the brain, um, become in control of what the behavior is, and that behavior could be not acceptable. So it's sort of a, you know, it's sort of an interaction or a lack of interaction between what a frontal lobes are supposed to do to the other lobes of the brain. Right. Especially the limbic system. Limbic system. Right. I mean, it, it, it interests me just as far as like how many people, you know, probably go to, uh, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, you know, with different complaints of, of depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, um, but actually have, you know, some kind of underlying, uh, you know, head injury that's sort of causing some of those symptoms. And it seems like a psychiatrist who's not going to integrate you know, these kind of uh, functional ways of testing brain function, um, that kind of seems like it could go undiagnosed and, and these people might not really be getting better. Absolutely correct. And I see it all the time. Um, just to give you one uh, recent example, a um, young man came in and his complaint was, uh, I'm irritable and I'm short-fused. And in his history... He was a little boy, five or six or seven years old, and he was involved in a car accident, and he was a, a, a rear seat passenger without a seat belt, and he ended up on the floor with his head being knocked back and forth like a basketball uh, between the, you know, the seat in front and the, the back seat. And nobody even thought that he could have had a head injury, but uh, sometime shortly after that, he began with his irritability and short fuse, and that's exactly what his EEG showed, cortical, what we call cortical irritability. And his spec scan showed, you know, the usual findings. And uh, he's um, currently being treated and he's starting to recover. And he's like, you know, almost 40 years old. So everybody thought that's just the way he was, but that's not true. And many people do not recognize or they forget or they were too young to even remember that they have had trauma when they were kids. Other examples are like, you know, kids climbing a tree and falling out of the tree and landing on their head or, you know, playing on a monkey bars, you know, upside down and, you know, something happens and you fall down. And nowadays they have soft landings, but, you know, years ago, you know, it was, everything was concrete. So it was a, it was a much harder hit. So, you know, I have learned that when I take a history on these people, I have to ask them multiple times in multiple ways and also have to instruct them to go ask your parents or other family members, siblings, what have you, 
you know, if they have any history of that, that anybody could remember. Sometimes they don't remember. Yeah. One of the, one of the really interesting cases I thought um, from your book was, was about the, I believe it was like the teenager or the college student and he had kind of slowly kind of deteriorated or, or maybe rapidly deteriorate, deteriorated um, in cognitive function in school and, and whatnot, but there wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't like he was in a coma. It was, you know, it was something that was kind of missed until you kind of went in and actually saw what was going on and then was able to sort of prescribe the right therapies to, to correct that. And that's absolutely correct. And in one of those cases, uh, I was even stunned that the spec scan was not only abnormal, but I mean, it was severe. I mean, the statistical analysis of one of those young guys was greater than minus four deviations in the front temporal pole of the left temporal lobe, which is, you know, the, the, the and I mentioned this and explained it in the book, the the front surface, the anterior, what we call the polar surface of the frontal temporal lobes, really get to the maximum of the brunt, even though the whole frontal and temporal lobes get it, but it's it's that cortex that actually bangs up against the bone. And I mean, you could see it clear in day, you could see the gradient on his spec scan. I mean, it was like, I mean, I have his picture memorized in my brain of what that spec looks like. And, you know, you can see like at the very front, it was like at the darkest color. And then as it went further back into the temporal lobe, I mean, the color lightened up, which indicated, you know, a lesser deviation is still abnormal. But I mean, you can actually just see the gradient inside of that one lobe. Now it all got better. And the other parts of the brain, you know, those areas of negative deviation contracted down because in, in both of those cases, those two, because they were brothers, um, each scan get, showed a little bit better over time. And then they stopped coming to see me. I don't know why, but, but it was enough data to say, you know, this is, this is what happened. This is how they responded. And, you know, this was the graduate group. And they both went back to school. Proposed, supposedly, they probably did well. But I don't have, sorry, I don't have the follow up on that. But one of those guys had a, his second concussion when he was playing goalie in a soccer game and he got hit right on the head by a fast moving ball and he went down and he was out unconscious they estimated about a minute and he got up and the curious thing of that case is that he had no symptoms of a concussion when he first got up which is usually when you see it at the worst and nobody thought that he had an injury therefore there was no medical evaluation but he paid the price later on. Interesting. Do you think that, uh, do certain people have kind of more susceptibility, whether that's maybe genetic or just structurally how their brains are developed as far as like being more susceptible or less susceptible to a head injury? Like if two people were to, you know, both get, you know, whacked in the head, you know, playing football or something, is one person likely to experience a lot more damage than someone else? Well, that's actually a very complicated question. <laughs> and the reason that it's a complicated question, which requires a complicated answer is because it, it depends upon the genetics of the person. But there have been, there are genetic studies that show that people that have the genes that predispose them to get Alzheimer's, uh, and you don't know who they are unless you do certain specific, you know, genetic tests. Apple allele is called. Um, it, the people that have the um, both both alleles positive for that, um, they could be at an increased risk to develop Alzheimer's because of number one, the genetic predisposition, and number two, the um, uh, the trauma. Because the, the literature so far shows now that if a person has like one big major head trauma, like I showed in my first two cases, or they have multiple smaller cumulative head injuries, that they are predisposed to get Alzheimer's. Mm. And I think I know the answer to that is because if you, you lose, we touched on it earlier, if you lose too many cells and many more connections, that's kind of what happens in Alzheimer's. You know, the cells die 
by whatever the mechanism is that is debated a little bit how the cells die, but the cells die because there's a metabolic process happening and they lose their connections just like I described before. And so, you know, if a person is, let's say, you know, 20 years old and let's say they lose, you know, 10% of their population, well, they're going to be at a 10% increased risk when they get older because we lose cells every day after the age of 30. So there's a normal loss of cells. It actually starts before that, but it really doesn't count. So you can start to be around 30. And so that, that those two combined losses of, of cells and neurons, you know, becomes cumulative until it reaches the point where there's no longer a reserve and then deficits start showing up. Interesting. Okay. Um, one thing we haven't touched on yet that, that you briefly alluded to, I believe, in the book. Tell me about um, hormones or hormone replacement uh, with traumatic brain injuries. I had seen something, I'm not sure if it was in your book or not, um, or from a different podcast, but about progesterone actually being uh, a super useful uh, following a TBI. Tell me a little about kind of the role of hormones. Well, hormones can be affected uh, by a TBI because the hormone control is from the pituitary gland, which is at the very base of the brain, which in turn is controlled by the hypothalamus. So there are certain molecules that are synthesized by specific cells in the hypothalamus that send signal to the pituitary, which in turn produces yet another um, hormone or messenger which goes into the blood which then goes to the target organs to produce the hormones that we know which are testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. So in the vast majority of mild traumatic brain injury, what we call MTBI, uh, the forces and the damage are not sufficient enough to get down to the base of the brain where the pituitary is so we don't see that. Uh, there can be isolated um, exceptions to that rule. And if someone has a complaint, like a guy who's complaining of loss of libido and erectile dysfunction, then you got to test the hormones and see if they're specifically deficient. And I have seen that. Where we see the major um, damage to the hypothalamus, it could be bleeding, it could be local fracture to the bones there and affecting the pituitary. Those are in the more severe cases. It's, and it's recommended to test all the hormones, and there's a whole bunch of them, when when you know when there's a more severe injury. And by the way, I should point out, you know, the there's a there's a a dichotomous irony to, you know, what's what the brain injuries you know look like. So whenever there's a moderate to severe injury, there's never a question. I mean, it's obvious this is a TBI. You know. You can see it by the scans or by looking at the person, you know, they're in a wheelchair, can't talk, can't walk, like I showed in my cases. And the complete opposite is true of the MTBI. You don't see anything. And the normal scans, the regular scans come back normal. And that's sort of like a that's sort of like a stumbling block for most physicians. So they can't get past using uh, the standard test to make the diagnosis. Anyway, getting back to the hormones. Um, so the hormones need to be tested, and if they're deficient, they need to be replaced. And the, that's a big how to re, how to replace them is sort of like a big topic because the the standard treatment for giving hormones is very unsatisfactory uh, because they're synthetic hormones for the most part, or they may come from uh, animals, notably estrogens. Uh, and they actually did a study in the year 2000, a uh, double-blind placebo-controlled study of those drugs that were used standardly to treat menopause because the study was never done before because they came out originally like in the 1950s, and we didn't even have double-blind placebo-controlled studies to determine efficacy and safety in those years. So someone decided to do that type of modern study in the year 2000. It was supposed to be a five-year study. Well. At about the midpoint, they decided that they had to stop the study because the women that were in the treatment arm, they were all dying, dropping dead. Hmm. Heart attack, stroke, um, vas you know, blood clots, uh, cancer of all the female parts, breast, uterus, ovaries. So they said, you know, this isn't fair. Uh, 
it, it, prior to that study, they thought these women were just dying of those conditions because they were old. But that turned out to be false. Just like these subtle changes on an EEG being normal turned out to be false. You don't know until you investigate scientifically and objectively. So when that came out, doctors were told, you know, the treatment is worse than disease. Don't give the medications. That created a tremendous void. Well, what do we do? So some doctors reasoned, well, let's give the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time because menopause is a very uncomfortable condition for women. And that, and that's what the traditional doctors do. Either they give that or they do nothing and the woman has to suffer because eventually this is the, the bad symptoms like the hot flush and all that stuff goes away. However, there's another type of treatment available by the alternative doctors or the integrative or the functional doctors, such as myself, which is called bioidentical hormones. So the bioidentical hormones are made at a compound pharmacy, and as the name suggests, the structure of each hormone is identical to what the body make, makes or made when you were younger, which means that when that product is entered into the body and it goes from the blood to the receptors on the, on the different uh, target organs, that it's going to affect those cells exactly as the innate biological molecule that the body used to make and have end up attaching to the receptor to do the thing, whatever it's supposed to do. So virtually no side effects. So if they have to be replaced, then it's a separate prescription for estrogen. Actually, it's three forms of estrogen. Never give uh, one type. And, and that's part of the, 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 the nastiness that I like to say of the standard treatment. Most Many doctors prescribe the one form, the predominant form called estradiol, which is actually the most dangerous form because that's the one associated with causing cancer to the female organs. So there's three forms of estrogen. There's only one form of progesterone and one form of testosterone, which are all given topically. Could be given under the tongue, but the whole idea is never in a pill form because once you take the pill and you swallow it, it goes from the stomach to the liver. The liver changes the molecular structure. Um, it's a... Um, you know, complex metabolic breakdown of the process. Then it comes out, the changed estrogen and progesterone comes out and goes into the circulation, but it's not the, but it's not the identical. So that's why it's never given as, a, as an oral tablet. I see. Okay. And, and then, the, so the progesterone or, or just the other hormones, um, so if, if they're deficient, you can replace them and then that can potentially does that have some, some brain impacts as far as healing a TBI? Uh, I think there's some literature on that. I have not looked at that very carefully um, because they, they, the, the articles that I've read tend to look at like one hormone or the other. And I don't think that's a very correct way or comprehensive way to look at it because, you know, if you're only going to look at progesterone, well, what about the other two hormones, you know? Sure. I mean, they all have some role in the brain. They do help the brain. You know, I'm not going to argue that they don't, but it's kind of the way it's hard to explain this because the, um, the traditional medical community is against the uh, bioidentical because there's no double blind placebo controlled studies in this country. And the reason for that is because the the bioidentical, which are made at a compounding pharmacy, that's the old uh, mortar and pester, they grind it up, from, well, they get a powder, they make it from scratch. Um, those type of medication cannot be patented. So nobody's getting rich off of those, like the big pharma companies are getting rich off of any of the drugs that they sell. So, so you've been in the field, you know, for a while now, and I'm curious as far as where, where you kind of see the future of, uh, you know, treating traumatic brain injuries um, specifically, but also just kind of more, uh, more broadly, just as far as the integration of kind of psychiatry, neurology, um, where, where do you see it going and what, what kind of applications uh, what new applications do you see for the future? Uh, well, I think that the future is fairly bright because there's always new and innovative work being done. Um, 
if I had anything to say, which right now I don't, but I'm trying to <laughs> by publishing a book and trying to be on as many forums as I can, uh, I would like to um, recommend the protocol that I've been using that's tried and proven for many years, which I've recently named uh, the WAN protocol, which is the three components, the nimodipine, neurofeedback, and hyperbaric, and if people want to take supplements, that's okay. Um, when I did the research on nimodipine, I discovered that there were no clinical trials, not one, for nimodipine on MTBI. I also discovered a new preparation of the drug in the liquid form, and I contacted the manufacturer of that uh, formulation, which is called Arbor Pharmaceutical in Atlanta, Georgia. And after a month or so of trying to get to the right person, I did, and I explained to him what I do, and you know, I said to them, uh, you guys should really sponsor a clinical trial so we can prove the efficacy in this condition because the safety has already been proved. And we went back and forth for about six months or so, and uh, he said, no, you know, we, we don't want to do it. We don't want to pay for it, but we'll donate the medication. So I have also been looking for funding to perform a clinical trial to establish the efficacy of nimodipine uh, in, in MTBI. Because all my information, even though I think it's very accurate and it's very good and it's thousands and thousands of people, is what we call anecdotal. And you know, doctors don't pay attention and listen until you have what's called the double-blind placebo-controlled study, which we I talked about before. So I think that if the future were to include such a study like that and um, it proved to be um, efficacious, which I believe it would based upon many years and thousands of patients, that that would actually be the first um, standard of care for treating TBI because right now there is no standard, which is another reason why I wrote the book, is to get this information out there because doctors don't know, people don't know, and you know, everybody should know. I mean, this is not a secret, I'm not, I'm not keeping it back. I mean, I've discussed it with some academicians, but I think they don't believe me because no one seems to be interested in collaborating with me. So, hmm. very sad but true. Well. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I guess a lot of, a lot of politics come into play. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, I want to really thank you for coming on the show today, Dr. Wand. Uh, you know, I really appreciated the, the discussion and I'd highly recommend for our listeners to go check out your book, uh, the concussion cure, which you're holding up right there. Go ahead, hold it up a little higher there. Perfect. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, any other resources, websites uh, that you would direct people to, Dr. Wand, if they want to kind of learn more about your work, learn more about the book? Well, I have uh, two, two websites. Uh, one is called brainhealingcenter.com. That has a lot of information about many conditions, including traumatic brain injury. And then I have a dedicated um, uh, website for the book is called the concussion um, and as we speak those two websites are actually going to be combined into one new website because I I have some new um, um, web web assistance to try to combine everything instead of having separate websites so um, you know, anybody is uh, welcome to look at the information that's there. There's some videos on uh, the concussioncure.com. Um, there's my office contact information in South Florida, you know, on, on both of them. And, uh, you know, we, we get people coming from all over the country and sometimes other countries uh, for the treatment because nobody seems to be doing it. Mm. Okay. And if, if any uh, if any researchers are listening to this who want to fund one of those clinical trials on nimodipine, definitely go to, uh, contact Dr. Wand. So uh, absolutely, maybe... that's, that's, uh, that would be a, a wonderful thing. Yes, absolutely.
All right. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. If you guys uh, enjoyed the episode today, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube uh, YouTube channel. It's Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. We're also on Instagram at Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. And you can listen to the audio version of the podcast anywhere uh, that podcasts are offered. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. Uh, we're on them all. So go check us out. All right, Dr. Juan, thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me. Absolutely.